Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are so delighted that you're a part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. Please be sure to check out our blog at readingwithyourkids.com. Also, please connect with us on Facebook, facebook.com slash readingwithyourkids. On Twitter, it's at Jedly Magic, and on Instagram, it's Reading with Your Kids. Our guest today is Elle Montemar. She is here to tell us about her beautiful book, Books in the Park. Before Elle tells us about books in the park, I want to let you know about a book that is on our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Hall of Fame. The name of the book is The Present is a Gift. It is a beautiful picture book written and illustrated by Elkanon Ogorik. This is a wonderful book that teaches children focus and mindfulness through the observation of mindful animals practicing yoga. This book is a wonderful resource for parents and caregivers on how to raise children with an understanding of the importance of love, kindness, gratefulness, and respect. And it's also great, a great way to learn some informative facts about the featured animals. This really is a beautiful book that would be a fantastic addition to any family library. It's The Present is Gift by Elhanan Ogorik. A Reading with the Kids Certified Great Read. Joining us on the line right now from the Houston, Texas area. She is the author of a super book called Books in the Park. Please welcome to the show, Elle Montemayor. Elle, how are you? I'm very good today. How are you? I am wonderful. Elle and I have just had a uh, wonderful conversation uh, about family and history, and it was just uh, just a lot of fun. And I can't wait for you to tell me all about Books in the Park. So um, Books in the Park is a um, children's book that was inspired by my work with the city of Dayton, which is the town I live in. Um, I worked with them to add little free libraries into all of our public parks. So um, during that work, I was inspired by this little story of how how are kids going to want to read in the park when you have a playground um, just footsteps away. And so um, I was writing and going to city meetings and um, this and that. And the story just came to life to me every step of the way it was. I could envision our library, our little free libraries, um, just working their magic because that's, I'm so passionate about, uh, book access for all. And so, um, when, once it came to life and I was able to read it to children, so many of them would come up to me and say, I'm that little boy in that book. I, I don't know what I want to read. I don't know what I like. And, um, so when I hear those things, I know it served its purpose. That's wonderful. And, you know, you point out a, a, a couple of things. First off, it is there are so many distractions today that are uh, screaming for kids, att- well, screaming for kids and adults' attention. Um, and there's so much flashier than books, you, you know. Uh, books are, are these beautiful things that tell these amazing stories. But you need to put some effort into them. You need to pick them up. You need to open them. You need to read them. You use your imagination. Well, meanwhile, there's so many things that are flashy and loud and, 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 and all you need to do is sit in front of them. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so yeah, this, there's a lot of competition for our attention. But also I think when a lot of times when we get kids, who are willing to say, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pick up a book, and then they go into a library or a bookstore or even stand in front of their their um, uh, their their family library, it's like, well, what do I want to read now? There, there's a lot of choices here, and I don't know where to go. Exactly. Uh, and as a teacher, it's even harder. Every year I get a brand-new batch of kids, and they expect me to – um, to just care about them holding a book and, you know, for that 20 minutes they're reading and they don't get that I'm, I want them to enjoy that 20 minutes. 
Um, not just pick up a random book, be invested in it. And so, um, those first weeks, first couple of weeks, I never talk about, you know, reading, reading, reading to the point that that's the only thing they think that I want them to do. I take time to learn who they are and learn their interests in a meaningful way, not just to eventually guide them to a book. So I'll ask them what, what their hobbies are, what, what do they like to do? What are they involved in? What kind of shows do they watch? And so I can figure out just who the characters are that they want to read about. And nothing's ever said about a book, but I'll work on incorporating those same things into the read alouds that I do. Mm-hmm. Instead of just suggesting a book, if I can get them involved in just the read aloud that I'm doing, then I know I'm onto something when they start uh, contributing to the conversations. You know, Elle and I were talking uh, about her being a, f- a fourth grade teacher for many years. She's becoming a third grade teacher. And someone magically transformed her. Either that or she got depromoted. I don't know how that works. But we were talking uh, about being a fourth grade teacher, and I was re- remembering my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Shute, at Lincoln School. And I remember, as, as you were just talking about doing read-alouds, I remember her reading aloud. And at first it was like, we're in fourth grade. We can read. We don't need you to read to us anymore. But then very, very quickly it was, hey, this is really cool. And mm-hmm. we love this. And, and I also remember getting hooked on a series. It was called the Todd Moran series. And Todd Moran was like a stowaway. And he would go on these these uh, sailing ships in, in the early, I think, the late 1800s, the early 1900s. And I, and I, I think it was Mrs. Shute who introduced me to that character and then uh, and let me know that there was, oh, there's a series, and it's not just one book. There's eight or nine of these books, so when you finish one, you can grab another and just keep going and going. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you're on the show and we're learning about books in the park, but I'm also really happy that our conversation is reminding me of this beautiful woman and how important <laughs> uh, she was in my life and how much she helped me develop a love of reading. Yep. And the times don't change in teaching. Like she did the same thing that we do. We hook them in with a series because then they're going to want to stick with it. They, if they like that first one, they're going to like the second and the third and the fourth. Um, and that doesn't change it. No matter what the technology is and what's going on in the world, a kid's going to get invested and they'll stick it through if they like that first one. Mm hmm. What, um, let's talk about some of the series that kids, uh, like now. I, I know I've, I've, um, I've looked and I can't find, uh, I, Todd Moran's not on Amazon or if it is, it's, you know, selling for like a thousand dollars for some old <laughs> co- copy. But tell, tell me what kind of series the kids are into in a fourth grade in the Houston, Texas area. Um, so they love a lot of the graphic novels and the, mm-hmm. um, comic style books, um, the Dog Man and um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And, um, you know, as a teacher, you love to see them reading. Like, we don't – I don't discourage anything, although it's not all grammatically correct. Mm-hmm. Get them reading. But you still want to try to show them variety. Mm-hmm. And so I'm as if, if a child's reading, a child's reading. And so I, I um, foster that as long as I can. But then – I'll try to take some of those aspects of those books and, you know, find that read aloud. I'm mean, picture books are, you know, a daily occurrence in my room. So I can kind of wiggle them into being in, interested in something else just by a simple picture book. Um, but going back to them reading whatever they can or want to, um, this last year, my daughter was in um, first grade, and I can't I can't get her to pick up a book that whole year. But she would read song lyrics, and I would not discourage that at all because to me, reading is reading. And um, so I know that kind of went off course of what your question was, but um, going back to it, the those series that you know are hooking kids, it's great. But we still need to show them that that classic 
um, traditional form of literature as well. And so um, I'm trying to think of some of the other once you're off for three months, your mind kind of goes blank of what what kids are holding in their hands. <laughs> but I love that you mentioned and, and reminded us that reading is reading. And I, I've mentioned many, many times on the show that uh, when, when my son was uh, in, well, all the way through high school, he, you know, he was a graphic novel fan. And, and uh, you know, I, while I encouraged him reading the graphic novels and, and brought many, many home, uh, it's one of the things when I would come home from a tour, I'd do educational magic shows and I'd be out and, uh, you know, there was a tradition when the kids were younger, I'd bring something home from my trip. Uh, but it was never a, a cheap toy or whatever. I'd go to a bookstore wherever I was and I'd find a book and bring them home. So I'd bring home the graphic novels. But I would, there were so many times I would go into the room and say, can you just read one book that doesn't have pictures in it, please? <laughs> you know, but I, you know, it is, it's true. It's, it's reading is reading. And whether you're reading a graphic novel or a comic book or song lyrics, you're still reading. You're taking part of, of, you're investing in, in a story that somebody's telling and you're, you're making that come to life in your mind. And that's, that's, yes. that's real important. So I think it's really important for us to remember that as parents. Mm-hmm. I, and I think a lot of parents, um, forget that and they, they forget that kids still love to be read to. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, at the beginning of last school year, um, for me, the teacher, I had a sign and books out that let's get a head start on re- still reading to your kids. You have the homework this year. Um, and many of them would write letters to me um, saying, thank you for reminding me just how wonderful it is to sit and read with my child. Talk about some of the advantages that kids, uh, that fourth graders um, who are, re- you know, read to by, with their parents or continue to read aloud with their parents. Talk about some of the advantages that fourth, grade, fourth graders get from that. Um, so... Big, big advantages um, academically are going to be hearing, you know, continuing to hear that uh, fluid reading, because as your sentences get more complex, you've got to process what is that punctuation doing in the middle of the sentence? And so they need to hear what that sounds like. Um, they can continue to hear the correct expression in the, the more in-depth conversations that have in chapter books um, and then the vocabulary. If you're going to, your vocabulary gets bigger the more you read, but if you're not understanding how to pronounce it as you're reading that, you're not really making the the full gain of it. But if you hear that vocabulary spoken by an adult, it's going to stick way better and you can recognize it um, when you see it in text. Um, And then the biggest benefit um, stepping off my teacher platform is that relationship that you're continuing to build uh, with your child, um, you just can't beat that. That is the best. Um, I, and then I, I go, I have an, I send home a, a note explaining all this, and then I tell them, you know, reading doesn't have to happen for 20 minutes, solid 20 minutes. It can happen in spurts, um, 10 minutes here, five minutes there, um, where you 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 fit it in. It's not a torturous thing where we got to sit down and read for the 20 minutes so that we can sign off and say we did it. Um, yeah, that defeats the purpose. <laughs> you know. When- oh, it does. <laughs> and that's why it turns into by the time you're in fourth grade, they dread reading time. Mm-hmm. But and if we can get show them that those little pockets of time add up, then they see the benefit mm-hmm. and they, it doesn't turn into that daunting task that they have to do each day yeah i was an athlete in high school and college and i loved it and i loved competing and i loved being you know being in shape and running and and all that stuff but a lot of times the running that you did was because you messed up you know you made a mistake so go run a lap you lost the game run a mile whatever it was so when i finished um, you know, being being uh, in in college when I finished my career as a competitive player, uh, when I went out to run, I would say to myself, "I, I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I punishing myself?" <laughs> and so I kind of lost the habit for uh, for a couple of years of of running because it just was connected to this oh this punishment. Oh, yeah. 
And it took me a while to kind of retrain my brain to understand, no, this isn't punishment. This is you're actually giving yourself a favor. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen when we're reading with our kids. We need to help them understand that this is fun. Mm-hmm. I, I do everything I can to bring it to life. I'll dress up as the book characters. Um, I'll I have uh, eye masks, like sleep, sleeping eye masks uh-huh. that I use in my classroom to they'll wear them. And then if I want them to start visualizing what I'm reading, they put those on and then I'll have them draw what they saw. Um, so I find just different ways to get them to invest in what's going on. And um, if you're excited about it, then they're excited too. I love that idea of, of helping kids to visualize because when we visualize when we're reading, it just brings it brings the experience to a whole new level. Mm-hmm. And what a great tool to, to use those sleeping masks to get the kids to really be quiet and close their eyes and to really visualize and then to have them draw what they saw. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a great exercise just to get them into the habit of visualizing. But I think it's also a great way to talk to the kids about, hey, there's 20 of us here and we all heard the same story, but look what you know, we all saw kind of different things, and what's that a whole uh, that about? Yes, that is. It's so amazing to see their perspectives on things, and then that's what's beautiful about reading is we can each take something totally different from the same story, and it helps us. It guides us. Yeah, and I think that that's, we, we have, we talked about this a lot too. I think that it's really important for us to help our kids understand that we all have different perspectives. We all look at the world through a different, through different experiences, through a different set of eyes. And, um, and I think if we understand that, it, and if we help our kids understand that, it, it can really kind of help break down some of the disagreements and some of the battles that we get into because of of those differences of of opinions and we can kind of start listening to each other better. Mm -hmm. I think Um, there's a big push for social emotional learning right now. And I mean, it's always been there, but it seems to be hitting hard right now. And I'm so excited about it. Last year, um, I started incorporating um, Mr. Rogers episodes into our breakfast time. Uh Uh-huh. And, um, you know, they watched that 20 minutes and it just transformed everything about this school year. It was one of the most incredible years that I've had. And, um, everything that would, you know, happen throughout the year, would Mr. Rogers, what would he think about this? What would he do? And we forget about those influential people. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering it sounds like you're, as a teacher, you're in an ideal situation where you're able to, to do these innovative things. Um, one of the things that I hear from a lot of teachers is there's so much pressure to get kids ready for standardized tests and to stick to this curriculum and to, uh, you know, like every minute of the day, of the school day is mapped out by a central administration. It sounds like you have a lot more flexibility than, than other teachers have. Um, I, I find ways to make it work. Ah. So (laughs) during the, that where we watched the Mr. Rogers. So, um, that was from seven to seven 30 ish. And then they have breakfast in our classroom from seven 30 to about seven 45. Um, most teachers would have the students sit in the hallway from 7 to 7.30 while they prepare for the day. Um, I invited them in. If they were going to be watching that show, they were they were going to be fine. There's no behavior issue there. They're, they're enjoying their time. So I could still do what I needed to do. Um, so that was my, my wiggle room. Um, and then with my read-alouds, I could incorporate both questioning. The questioning for that social-emotional side as well as, um, all the ac- academic standards that prepare them for the test. So we would have two kind of different conversations going on at the same time. But more times than not, any conversations that would go back to it later on would be related to those social emotional, um, conversations. And so I knew that there's comprehension and there was grasping, um, 
the importance of it still happening. That's fabulous. And, and I, I love that you're, you know, using, that you're using your imagination to take and, and, and find different ways to do the things with the kids that you want to do. Oh, it, I don't know that I could handle it if I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, let's one of the questions that I've asked authors who are also also teachers is, um, and, and we've had some fun answers. If I gave you my magic wand that I use, well, I don't use a magic wand in my educational magic shows, but if I gave you a magic wand and you were able to wave it and change the education system in any way, what would you do and what changes would you make? Oh, man. Um, I think what I would do is – design a more appropriate uh, standardized test. I believe that they do have a, do serve a purpose. Um, we do need to know where our kids are. We do need to know that the teachers are doing what they're supposed to. Um, but so often you see these questions that are just so wordy and um, so far out there that you just don't feel like, it's necessarily appropriate for that age you're working with. Um, and that is really the most frustrating thing about it. Cause we can fit in the fun lessons that pull us, pull everybody into the activity. Um, we have, I, I can't speak for other teachers because, um, there are campuses with way stricter, um, administrators, mm-hmm. but I've left out where, they trust me. They see that the things are happening. This, this, and this is getting checked off. Um, so I would just love to see a more appropriate test that doesn't intimidate our kids and stress our kids out to where that's the only thing they care about all year long. They need to know that, you know, it's just a thing you got to do for a day. Right. And then it's moving on. And that, yeah, you know, there, there, we talk a, a lot about, you know, kids – suffering from anxiety and stress and that there are so many kids uh, dealing with depression these days. And, and I think a lot of it is that we're just recognizing it more. You know, there were always kids who felt stressed and, and felt anxiety and felt depression, but we, and we're better at recognizing it. But I think also there's a lot of stress, un, unneeded stress being placed on kids by things like you know, the standardized test, we got to do this. And it's, oh, it's, I, I think here in Massachusetts, it's a, a four or five day ordeal. Oh, wow. Kids have to go. Yes. <laughs> I hear I like, we have three in fourth grade. Um, fifth grade has three. And then third grade is the first year that they test. So they have um, two. Um, so that'll be kind of a relief to know that I'm only focusing on that one reading one and then my math partner will focus on the math but um it's still it's still just tough that they work so hard during the day and then they do these massive tests to prepare them for it frequently throughout the year and you know they're there to learn not to take a test Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm We're we're talking earlier about um, books in the park and the fact that there are a lot of kids that come up to you after reading books in the park and say, I am that that boy. I'm the boy in in the story. Uh, What other kind of reaction are you getting from parents and and kids who've read the book? Um, It's opening a lot of conversations um, to guide the kids. They get they will start wanting to talk about how do I figure out what to read or where do I begin? And so. Um, parents are noticing that teachers are kind of getting the same thing that I am is that's me. How do I fix that? Can you help me find it? Find what I need. Um, so it's not a, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for. It's opening more conversation and inquiry. Um, and all my a blog posts that I, um, I sent for you to link is um, a freebie of questions to just guide that conversation. Yeah. And that's, I think that's really important. We, we talked earlier about, you know, b- uh, kids going into a library or bookstore and just being overwhelmed by all the choices. And right. it's just that conversation. Well, what do you, what, what do you like first? And just helping parents know that they can help their kids find some characters, some series that they can fall in love with, and that will hopefully lead to a lifelong love affair uh, with learning and reading. Yes. Um, I use that questioning um, as part of a 
a project in my classroom as well where they become experts. So once we find out what their interests are, we turn that into them being the expert of the classroom and they are then, you know, our go-to for that subject. And oh. it makes it so much easier to, you know, talk to the librarian about, you know, what direction do we want to go in um, for the student Um and we can then say, okay, well, let, we're focusing on nonfiction in the classroom right now. Can you guide them to that topic in nonfiction? So there's a easier buy-in. Mm-hmm. Well, that's fantastic. It sounds like you are in an ideal place where you're you're working as a team and you know in partnership with your librarian and you have a supportive of administration and and you're working with parents and and that just seems like an ideal situation. And Books in the Park sounds like a fabulous book to for any family to add to their family library. Where can folks find Books in the Park, and where can folks connect with you online? Um, so you can purchase it directly through my website, and um, if you go that route, I will include uh, personalization. Just leave it in the comments, and I'll give it get it in the mail, and I include um, some special bookmarks through there. Um, it's available on Amazon and, um, to connect, I'm on Instagram at L dot Montemayor and Facebook L Montemayor. And then my website is L Montemayor.com. We have been speaking to the author of books in the park, L Montemayor. L, thank you so much for being part of our show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful experience. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Noelle Ill. She is the author of If You're Scary and You Know It, another fantastic title coming from our friends at Familius.com. Hey, uh, we told you earlier uh, about the present is a gift, and it is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read. Being a a Reading With Your Kids certified great read, it's a wonderful way to help your book stand out amongst the crowd of books that are published every single month. Now, what we've done is we've assembled a team of evaluators, your parents, teachers, and kids. And if they think that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a certified great read. And with that status comes a number of tools that really let parents know that your book is worthy of their consideration and would be a, an, a wonderful addition to their family library. You can learn more about this program by going to our website, Reading With Your Kids, and click on the Great Reads application button at the top of the page. We want to thank the people who made today's show so very wonderful. El Montemar, be sure to check out Books in the Park. I also want to thank my producer, Fatima Khan. Please be sure to check out Fatima's blog at readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all of the support that she gives me. And we want to thank you. Thank you so much for being part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids family. And thank you so much for helping make the world a better place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.